The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Okay, so, uh, dear Ajahn, if a person has seen a separation of mind from the body, uh, what should that person do to take it to the next step? Uh, uh, at the time, it was a wow moment. Now, looking back, uh, I should have done uh, done some uh, more of contemplation then. Some, okay, some, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, this uh, particular uh, kind of uh, mind separation of mind or the body, kaya citta parichedanyana, something like that, it's called, I think it's, it's found in the Visuddhimagga, it's not really found in the suttas. So, um, uh, is this good? Yeah, whatever kind of insight you have on the path and you see this kind of separation as you understand that uh, uh, the kind of the, you understand a little bit about non-self when you see these separations, uh, these things not being yours, uh, they're being uh, replaceable, you can check them out and it doesn't really matter so much. Uh, so they are like what I would call kind of uh, preliminary insights on the path to the big ones. Uh, personally, I don't really pay that much respect to the commentaries. Uh, uh, in terms of insight and things. It's very common in many of the meditation traditions to do that, uh, but I don't really think it is required. One of the suttas that I uh, read out at the meditation retreat we had down at Anglesey uh, is a sutta called the Pasadika Sutta, the Delightful Discourse. Uh, and in that sutta, the Buddha talks about his own Dhamma, and he says that in my Dhamma there is nothing superfluous and nothing missing here. Yeah, everything that you need for a full a course in contemplation is actually found in the suttas. Uh, and because nothing is missing, you don't actually need to add things like the Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa Parichelana, that's what it's called, that's right. You don't need to add these kind of things that are kind of invented later on uh, uh, and to you know, name these things in a particular way. It is efficient to follow the instructions in the suttas. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with this, uh, but I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Uh, if I w were you, I would just carry on with the path of uh, uh, you know, watching the breath or taking a meditation to a deeper stage. Uh, and as you do that, then the, uh, eventually the deep insights into all the aspects of mind and body will unfold as a consequence. Uh, and we don't need to label it too tinily. And the, one of the problems with labeling it too tinily is that uh, Everybody has a different approach, a different experience in meditation practice. Uh, sometimes by labeling things in this way, uh, you force your experience into a system uh, that may not actually be applicable to you. Uh. And it's very common in all of these kind of systems to see that progress in meditation precisely because they are labeled and then whatever you experience tends to somehow fit that label yeah, because you read things into it. Uh. So because the Buddha didn't say this, I tend to kind of uh, not be too worried about that. I would say, okay, good, uh, nice insight, then carry on and bring it further. Keep on going with uh, vipass samatha and vipassana uh, simply by watching the breath or by doing some of the other meditation topics mentioned in the suttas. Uh, and as you do that, you will gain all the benefits of the path without having uh, to go to the commentaries. Uh. So uh, this doesn't mean that it is anything wrong necessarily with that commentarial explanation, uh, but uh, the fact that the Buddha didn't mention it uh, uh, makes it to me seem that it is uh, uh, superfluous, not really required, and it may perhaps in certain occasions be misleading uh, as well. Uh, that's why I'm a bit wary of these things. Uh. So um, is that what you asked? I'm not even sure now if that's what you asked. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Yeah, so keep on doing the contemplation, that is exactly right, and you can keep on contemplating that if you like, uh, and that separation may actually lead to a further insights when you understand that this is about non-self, this is about impermanence, uh, it's about dukkha and all of this. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what I was in a sense talking about before, about the Anapanasati Sutta. I was talking about it way too fast, but the, the whole point of that is precisely to see this kind of thing. You see things uh, being impermanent, you see things ceasing, and when you, especially when you see things ceasing, uh, it's a very powerful moment, uh, possibility of insight. Uh, because when something disappears completely, first of all, it is the most profound sort of impermanence. Yeah, Something is completely gone, that is absolute impermanence. Uh, so you gain a full, stand, full insight into impermanence regarding that particular thing. Yeah? 
So if your body disappears, uh, uh, you go into a deep state of samadhi, the body is completely gone, you know the body is utterly impermanent. You, impermanent. you know you can't exist without it, uh, because you carry on right now without that body. Uh. Not only is it impermanent, uh, but when it disappears, boy, is it happy. Yeah, the body was so much dukkha, now the body is gone, you feel so much better without that body. Uh. So you, kind of, you have a different outlook about the body afterwards. Uh, you never really appreciate the body so much anymore. Uh. Sometimes we think we can get pleasure out through the body, uh, but the pleasure you can get through the body is tiny compared to the pleasure you can get by abandoning the body. Uh. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, it's kind of complete opposite of what we normally do. Uh. And the last one is the fact that you also see the body as non-self, because uh, uh, when you let go of the body completely uh, and you no longer have any access to the body, uh, you can't even feel it even if you want to, uh, it means it must be non-self because uh, anything that is self we can control, we can have some kind of uh, uh, access to it. can't have any access to it, uh, by definition it's non-self. Uh, so very deep insights come mainly from cessation of things, and cessation of things uh, happens on the path uh, to samadhi. That's where real cessation and ending happens. Uh, that's the kind of insight that you find in the suttas, uh, and that's the kind of insight I would go for, for that reason. Uh, I'm sure you can see what I'm talking about, it's fairly, fairly obvious in a way, you just have to kind of learn to think in that particular fashion, I suppose. Uh. So, that's the only question. You are, must be very peaceful. Yeah, no questions. Yeah. <laughs> very impressive. Yes. <laughs> how, how does one uh, deal with regret? How, okay. How, how, how do we yeah. remove regret okay. from the mind? Okay. I will repeat the question just for the recording. How do you deal with the regret when it uh, arises? Uh, and obviously from that sutta, that sutta the uh, First thing, the way to deal with regret is to make sure you live as well as possible, yeah? because then at the very least uh, you won't make any more regret for the future. Uh. So that is the first thing that you learn from that sutta. Regret that has already arisen, however, you have to deal with in a different way. Uh. So anything that you feel in the past you wish you uh, would, uh, would have done differently, uh, the best way is what I mentioned before this morning. Were you here this morning? We're talking about forgiveness. Uh, yeah, Go back to that idea of forgiveness again. Uh, because uh, forgiveness is very powerful. Uh, and uh, the, the clue to forgiveness, the whole trick around it, uh, is to understand that people don't really have much choice in what they do. Uh. And once you understand that, and you understand it applied also to yourself, maybe you feel that I did things, we have all done things in the past that we're not entirely happy with. Uh, this was part of being a human being. Uh, so once you understand, you see yourself in the same light, uh, that you know, you understand that the, you're, how conditioned you are, uh, often through uh, things that happen in past lives, but things that happen in this life as well. Uh, once you see that, you start to have compassion for yourself. Uh, you realize that you are trapped to a large extent, uh, and the, you can only, very often, you can only actually do what you do, uh, and you can't really do much more than that. Uh. Then this is a result of the idea of non-self, yeah, because non-self means that we are entirely conditioned as human beings. Uh, and what the more you see, it's hard to see because it goes against the grain. The grain is that it feels that we are independent entities. We can act autonomously. Yeah, I can choose to do A, I choose to do B. Can you really do that? And the more you look at yourself, the more you understand yourself, the more you realize actually it's very limited what, what you can do. And I told a story on the retreat. I, I, I may have told it here before. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it again because it was a very powerful story. And I might as well tell it. Uh, there doesn't seem to be that many questions anyway. So I'll tell the story just to kind of. It is, and it's a very interesting story. That's why I like it. Uh, and this was a story of um, a fellow in Perth, uh, one of the members of the Buddhist Society, BSW, Buddhist Society of Western Australia. And he uh, was a, he was a Catholic yeah, originally, but then he started to come to the meditation classes, and he became more and more Buddhist. Uh, I think eventually he wasn't a Catholic anymore, but uh, he started out as a Catholic. Yeah. So for him, the idea of rebirth was completely alien. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it was because he was Catholic or it just kind of didn't fit with his personality or whatever. But it was completely alien to him. Yeah. But then one day he decided that he wanted to do a past life regression. Yeah. One of the main members of our Buddhist society was, uh, is a very, uh, was quite well known in our Buddhist society for doing past life regressions. Uh, he also happens to be a very nice man, yes? everybody liked him, uh, so they went, okay, let's go and see him and do past life regression, kind of how it works together here. 
So he went to this man and he decided, okay, you know, um, hypnotize me and then see what comes out. And then he started to talk, yeah, and he talked about this thing that seemed to be a past life, yeah, going on about the kind of person he was, uh, how he had emigrated to Australia from Ireland. Uh, Ireland was a very, very poor country back then in the 1840s or whatever, everyone was dying from famine and things. Uh, so masses of Irish people migrated around the world. That's why there are such strong Irish communities in, uh, around the world, yeah, uh, in America, in Australia, many other places. Uh. Uh, and he was one of these people, and he came to Australia and he started a farm in the southern part of WA and built up this farm, working really, really hard, yeah, and all of these things. Uh, and f and uh, uh, then he remembered who his wife was, he remembered the name of his wife, of his children, uh, what kind of work he had been doing before he became a farmer, uh, what his house looked like, yeah, details like that, uh, astonishing. Uh, and all of this came out through this past life regression. Uh, and the very last thing that he remembered, and this was kind of maybe the most interesting part, uh, was that as he was dying on his deathbed, yeah, he was looking back on his life. This very often happens when you're about to die. You have like a review of your life. Uh, and his review of his life, one part of that was that he felt very proud. Uh, yeah, I came to Australia with nothing, uh, and I built up this large farm with a great success, uh, which now is working really well, and I can pass it on to my uh, children, to the next generation, or whatever. feeling very proud of what they have done, uh, and probably in some ways, rightfully so. Uh, uh, but now he rem remembered all these things, and he couldn't deal with it, uh, yeah, because he didn't believe in rebirth, uh, and now suddenly he has all these kind of things staring him in the face, uh, and then he was in complete denial for a few months. Uh, yeah, I don't want to have anything to deal with it. Uh, and then after being in a den denial for a few months, uh, he kind of was getting, getting over it, getting used to the idea. So he went back to this uh, regressionist and tried one more time to see what happened. Yeah? Same things again. Uh, okay, now I've got to do something with this. I, I've got to do something because this is just too much. Uh, so then he decided to go into the records that I kept in Australia of the migrants who came here. Uh, to find if there was such a person. He had a name, his own name, yeah, he had all the details. Uh, and sure, sure enough, th there was exactly one person who fitted the bill really well. Uh. So then he, <laughs> then he started to feel, you know, maybe now, at, by, by this point, he started to actually, you know, think maybe rebirth is a reality after all. Yeah, this is becoming very strong. Yeah. And then he went down to that place, that farm that he was supposed to have been to, uh, and found a place that seemed to be exactly what was the place where he had, you know, built up this farm and all of these kind of things. Uh. And by the end of all this, doing all of these things, uh, he became convinced uh, that there had to be rebirth. Uh, yeah, he would, had no doubt anymore. Uh. But the point of this story is not that. Uh, that's, that's just this kind of. Uh, side issue. The point of the story is that in this life uh, he is a very successful businessman. Uh, yeah, he lives in Western Australia, he does some kind of software for the mining industry. Uh, yeah, in Western Australia everyone lives off the mining industry, that's kind of what we do over there. <laughs> Not, probably, probably even monks, yeah, probably the donations, the food we get probably comes from mining profits originally. Yeah, so we are probably beneficiaries of the mining industry as well, okay. So we're all part of the same economy. And uh, he was very successful, yeah, a multi-million dollar company. I, never, I, never, I have no idea how much money he's made, but obviously he's quite well off. And um, he feels a sense of, you know, I've built this up in my own two hands. I feel proud of what I've done. I've worked really hard, yeah, from my own initiative, yeah, getting everything done and sort of doing this because I wanted to work really hard. Yeah. But now he realized that actually he hadn't wanted this at all. Yeah. He realized that this... Uh, a feature of his, this characteristic of his, of working really hard, wanting to make things uh, go, uh, was something that he carried over from a past life. Uh, it was exactly the same habit that he had in his past life, yeah? And he realized it had nothing to do with him. It was just the habit that he was carrying on from one existence to the next one. Uh, and that turned everything upside down. Uh, instead of being proud of it, uh, instead of feeling, yeah, you know, I'm really good, he realized that it had nothing to do with him. He was like on a program, he was on being like a robot, doing what he had to do, because he was conditioned to do it. Uh, and suddenly, he felt an aversion to this whole, whole thing, uh, aversion to his own success, aversion to working really hard to make it work, uh, because he felt uh, that he was trapped in that, uh, rather than doing it of his own free will. Uh. So this is the power of conditioning. Yeah? In this life, you feel that, we all feel that we have done certain things. Sometimes we regret it, sometimes we feel proud of it. But actually, if you saw the bigger picture, if you were able to see your past lives, you would start to realize this has nothing to do with you. It is not your fault at all. You were programmed in this way. 
So this is the power of having the larger picture. This is the problem of lacking the ability in seeing your past lives. You lack that bigger perspective, and then you think you're responsible. Then you blame yourself, then you feel regret, and then you have this problem. So try to see the non-self of this. Try to have more compassion for yourself. Yeah? Whatever it was, and we all need to have that compassion for ourselves. Uh, then you start, it becomes easier to forgive. Uh, and what happens when you forgive is that instead of blaming yourself, as soon as we start blaming ourselves, uh, it's like we shut our ability to investigate, get shuts down, uh, because the blame narrows down our mind and we just kind of feel bad about it. Uh, if you stop blaming, uh, you stop criticizing yourself, and you just look at it with a rational mind, uh, then you start to be enab enable yourself to find the solution to these problems. Uh, so at the very least, you don't do it again in the future. Uh, if you blame yourself, very likely you will start doing it, do it again, because you feel bad and you, kind of, you, you lose your ability to see clearly and you do the same mistake again. But if instead of blaming yourself, you stand back and say, this was a mistake, no need to blame, it was a mistake, I was conditioned in this way. What can I do now to avoid the same problem in the future? Then you are on the right track, then you start to get insight into the problem, then you can move out of this and you can move forward into the future. Okay, very good. <laughs> Okay, is there anyone else who would like to uh, ask? Them? Yes, please. Uh. I suppose uh, it's um, from all the rebirth that you just mentioned. The, the question now comes to how to end all this, how to end the, the rebirth. Mm -hmm. um, so what what the best way to achieve that? Okay, best way to achieve ending rebirth? Uh, not... not <laughs> Not to be reborn, maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've got to be very diligent. Yeah, this is this is the problem. It is it is uh, it is not an easy thing to end a rebirth. It doesn't happen. Like, actually, it's not difficult. It's just that it takes a lot of commitment and perseverance. Uh, but uh, one of the most important things is just to live your life well. Uh, and uh, I say that if you are able to take that idea of living your life well to the highest, as far as you possibly can, so that you. Remember this, you remember how important it is. If you really are keen on ending rebirth, you want to end and make, make an end of suffering, uh, uh, you realize that your commitment to every moment matters. Uh, yeah? Everything you do all day long matters if you're going to have success in ending rebirth. Uh, and the most important thing that you can do in your daily life uh, or any part of your life uh, is to be kind. Uh, that is the most important thing. Yeah? At the very least, in your mind, you don't have to express it outwardly all the time because that becomes impossible. At the very least, mentally, you have a sense of compassion and kindness. Uh, so this is really the critical thing. And if you can do that, you are transforming yourself into a fully virtuous being where this becomes a habit. You become kind by habit. Uh, then meditation is going to work and everything else follows from that. Uh, it's always the foundation stone that is the most important one. Get the foundation stone in place. Uh, everything starts to happen here. So how can you do that? It is interesting because it is actually quite difficult to always be kind because we, our habits from the past, they catch up with us. You get angry and upset in certain situations because I have told you a million times, don't say that. I don't like, you know, the habits are so strong. Yeah, it's very hard to kind of get out of that. So one of the most important things is to enable you to get out of that habits that are bad is actually to uh, make sure that you have a regular Dhamma input that reminds you of what is important in life. Uh, this is where people often go wrong. They think that they are independent. Uh, they think, I can do my own practice without the Dhamma input. Uh, but then after a while, you lose the inspiration. You lose the ability. Uh, why? Because it isn't that deeply settled in you yet. Uh, you lose a little bit of the view. You lose a little bit of that understanding you had before. So you need to renew it again and again and again. Uh, and uh, I told her on the retreat, as, as a beautiful simile in the suttas about this. And uh, in this sutta, the Buddha talks about the causes for liberation, which is the ending of rebirth. Uh, yeah, and he traces those course, causes backwards. So the uh, the the uh, kind of final cause for liberation is uh, the seven bojangas, seven factors of awakening. Uh, they give rise to liberation. The causes for the seven bojangas, four satipatthanas, the cause for that, the three kinds of good conduct, and it takes it back and back to the very first step. Uh, and the very first thing that is the cause for awakening is uh, to, uh, to um, associate with good people. Uh, 
Sapurisa, Sang Seva, or and the, these good people. Uh, the primary good person in the Buddhist context is the Buddha. Uh, yeah. So any teaching uh, that properly expresses the word of the Buddha, whether you read the suttas themselves or you hear the Dhamma talk that properly explain the suttas, uh, is going to be that cause, that root, that uh, uh, seed which actually gives rise to everything. Uh. And the Buddha says it's like a mountain. You have a mountain. You have rain on the mountain. Yeah. When it rains on the mountaintop, if it keeps on raining, eventually that rain forms into little streams. If it keeps on raining, those little streams form into larger streams. If it keeps on raining, those larger streams go into the lakes. If it keeps on raining, the lakes fill up. Keeps on raining, that small lakes fill up and they overflow into the large lakes. And eventually, if it keeps on raining, the large lakes also overflow. They go into the rivers and eventually the rivers go to the ocean. The ocean is here, a simile or for Nibbana. Yeah, you go all the way to the ending of rebirth, if you like. Yeah, that's what the ocean is. Uh, and the way to get to the ocean is just to make sure it keeps on raining on the top of that mountain. Uh, that rain on the top of the mountain is hanging out with the good people. Uh, yeah, listening to the suttas, allowing yourself slowly to gain that view that the Buddha had. Gradually, gradually changing your view, seeing the world in that way getting inspired on the path. The rain comes and comes and comes. Keep on listening, keep on listening. Raining, 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 raining. Consequence of that, you have eventually to reach the ocean. Beautiful simile, yeah? So keep the rain coming. Keep doing the right thing. Be kind, listen to the Dhamma talks. Do, do all of these things. And then eventually, uh, uh, ending of rebirth must happen as a consequence. It's a natural causal consequence that comes from that. Great, so easy. Just listen to Dhamma talks, yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Very good. Huh? <laughs> Any more huh? questions or points of controversy or anything anyone would like to say? Huh? Yes, please. If you could please talk about Nibbana. Okay, okay, Nibbana, okay, sure. Uh, okay, so Nibbana, one of the reasons why you struggle with the idea of Nibbana is because every time you read the suttas, it just says Nibbana. Yeah, it doesn't actually s explain what it is, it just says the word Nibbana. And this is, I think, is a bad idea of translation, that you leave these ancient Indian words untranslated. So if people don't have it translated, then how can they be expected to know what it means? Uh, and because they have no idea what it means, they read anything they want into Nibbana. And Nibbana means everything, you know, from whatever you kind of want it to mean, that's what it tends to mean. Uh. So what we should do, uh, and because the word Nibbana had a very clear meaning in an ancient Indian context, it had a meaning in that language, uh, and what it means is like extinguishment. Uh. This is the actual literal meaning of that word. It's like the flame going out, the flame getting extinguished. So Nibbana, when you Nibbana, you get extinguished. Does that sound good? <laughs> okay, so let me, let me just explain that in a little bit more detail, yeah? so what that actually means. So <laughs> extinguishment means, and the main idea of extinguishment and Nibbana in the suttas is the extinguishment of the defilements of the mind. Yeah, so you extinguish greed, you extinguish uh, ill will, you extinguish delusion. Now it sounds a bit better, yeah? So these things get kind of get snuffed out like a flame, yeah? It's gone. And then that is what extinguishment actually refers to in the suttas. There is a prevailing idea that Nibbana means what happens when the Arahant dies, yeah? When the Arahant eventually dies, what happens after that? But actually that's not what Nibbana is. In the suttas, Nibbana is always defined as the extinguishment of the defilements of the mind. So it shows you that it's possible to reach a point uh, where all of these negative influences in us can actually be completely overcome. Uh. So you may find that in your meditation practice sometimes your mind is clear and bright. Uh, yeah? In other words, the defilements are low. Uh. The point is, it's possible to get to a permanent state like that. Uh, yeah? That's kind of the point of this. Uh. Then you have some idea what it's about. Uh. So. This is number one that gets extinguished, and that is uh, quite easy to understand. Uh, another one that gets extinguished is suffering. Uh, yeah. So what is so when suffering gets extinguished, what happens? Well, the opposite happens. You become happy. 
if suffering is gone, the, uh, the uh, reverse happens, and the uh, corollary of that is that you become happy. Uh, I should say the corollary of the three root defilements disappearing is also the opposite. Yeah? Instead of being greedy and having lots of desire, you become extraordinarily generous. Uh, and this is one of the things that you find among people who are very well developed on the path. They become very generous. Uh, you ask them for something, for some help or whatever, they will always be willing to give, always willing to share. This is one of the ways you can tell when someone has gone long on the path or not. It is not enough to know it, but it's one of the things that come out of it. You have given up ill will, so if you have given up ill will, it means that you're full of compassion and kindness and metta and all of these things to other people. Yeah, This is the corollary of giving up ill will. You have given up delusion. Giving up delusion means you have a very clear mind. You, are, you have this. Uh, you don't. Uh, you don't get confused. Yeah, and all of these kind of things. You have a clarity about yourself. It doesn't mean that you necessarily are very articulate. You don't have necessarily have to be able to give dhamma talks, uh, but it means that uh, you, you don't. They don't look confused. They don't look deluded. Uh, they have a clarity about them, a calm about them, a peace about them. All of these things come from giving up the delusion because you give up restlessness. Uh, you give up the, the, the kind of the uh, drowsiness or, or the dullness that people have, and all of these things. Uh, so this is, this is what Nibbana is like. Yeah? This is actually what it means. Uh, sound all right? Yeah, sorry? Please? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so does that mean that there is still some form of existence then? Um, I, it's, it's the wrong way of thinking about Nibbana in, term, in terms of existence or non-existence. Because, uh, and the reason why it's the wrong way to think about it is because uh, as long as you have a sense of self, it is very hard to understand what Nibbana can, can be. A sense of self gets in the way for a proper understanding of that. Because the only way that you can, if, if someone says that you know, when the Arahant dies, then you know, uh, the Arahant just disappears, uh, well to you that will seem like some kind of annihilation. Yeah, bang, someone has, has been annihilated. Or if they carry on afterwards, it will seem like eternalism. There's something going on for afterwards. So you will fall into this dichotomy either annihilation or eternalism. But both of those are wrong. And the reason why you have to fall into that one or the other is because of the sense of self. The sense of self forces you to take one of those two sides. So the only way you can really understand Nibbana is by actually coming to that point where you have that experience of non-self for the first time and you, s you understand your own mind fully for the first time. Then you will understand what Nibbana is about. Because then you will have taken away that delusion that distorts everything uh, and makes it impossible to understand. Uh. So in the meantime, it is you just follow the path because it, it works, it makes you happy, it works well. Uh. You know that Nibbana is the ending of all these negative qualities. Yeah, that's absolutely sure. It's the ending of suffering, it's the highest happiness. Uh. So you say, okay, that's good enough, I'll just go for it. Uh. Then I'll f understand what this is about when I finally come to the end of the path. Uh. But it's very, it's very tricky. It's tricky precisely because of the root delusion that lies in the mind, that distorts an understanding of what these things actually are. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so just on, on retreat, you made reference to the Deva realms um, and you talked about rebirth and I think it was sort of, you were... You mentioned it would be good to be reborn in a deva realm and you sort of laughed, so I don't know how serious <laughs> that was. My understanding yeah. is that the best place to be reborn is a physical birth where the Dharma is present. Um, so I just, yeah. yeah, if you could talk more about yeah. that, deva yeah. realms and rebirth. And is there, is there a deva realm where you can continue to practice the path? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think what I was talking about on the retreat, there's one... Uh, interesting passage in the suttas where the Buddha talks about the deva the recollection of the devas, uh, and uh, that me and th that is defined in the way that uh, uh, you look at those qualities those devas uh, had to be able to be reborn there. You think I have the same qualities, yeah? So you're kind of happy that at least now you have kind of a good future. You may not make even if you don't make it all the way to nibbana, at least you have a kind of positive outcome to that extent, yeah? So the point about this is that the path, even if you don't practice it all the way, you will always have good results one way or another. Yeah? So that, I think that was what I was referring to. I d didn't really kind of want to, to suggest that you should be reborn as a deva, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, but I didn't want to not suggest that either. I, you know, I, did, I was actually completely neutral on that. Uh. 
And I know this is a very prevailing view in, among Buddhists, that the idea that we shouldn't be reborn as a deva because human realm is the best one to be reborn and all of this kind of uh, things. Uh, but uh, there is no real record of the Buddha saying that. Uh, the Buddha doesn't say, try to be reborn as a human because being reborn as a deva is going to block you in your practice. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because, uh, is it because it is such a prevailing view among Buddhists uh, I have often wondered where exactly does that view come from? Uh, and I wonder whether it comes from some kind of later commentarial work. Uh, maybe it comes from even from Mahayana Buddhism. I'm not sure where it comes from. Uh, but to me, the Buddha never says it. And uh, I, for that reason, I think that is actually perfectly okay to be reborn as a deva. Instead of trying to kind of, you know, force yourself to be reborn in a certain place, uh, you can imagine you're about to die and then you have to try to kind of figure out, now, what do I have to do now to make sure I get... Re and you. And, you know, it's difficult enough to die already, yeah? And then you mess it all up, and then who knows what's going to happen. So I say, when you die, relax, yeah? <laughs> Chill. Just die. Difficult enough already. And die, and then let karma take its own course. Wherever karma takes you, allow that to be. Don't try to kind of make this happen in a certain way. Huh? And yes, the answer is, it is possible to practice in the Deva Loka as well. Huh? There's many examples in the suttas of uh, uh, Devas becoming enlightened, they're becoming stream mentors and all these kind of things. Uh, one example is Sakka, the uh, supposed ruler of the uh, heaven of 33, uh, yeah, Sakka himself, the ruler of the heaven, uh, he comes down to the see the Buddha, the Buddha gives him a discourse and bang, he becomes a stream enterer, uh, yeah, uh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, so it means that even in the heavenly realm, it is possible to gain access to these kind of insights. Uh, the other thing about the heavenly realms, which is obviously really nice, uh, if you get reborn there, there's going to be so many areas there, so many noble people there. Because where do the noble people get reborn? Well, they get reborn usually in fairly high realms. Uh, so even though in humanity, who knows how many there are here, up there, many more, yeah? So it's not, not good company, these areas, yeah? They give you right view and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so much better. Uh, so I, I think that this kind of idea is uh, overemphasized. Uh, and I personally, I don't even believe it, to be honest with you. Uh. Okay, so that is uh, all for today. Uh. So uh, have a good night, a good night's rest, and then we'll see you back again tomorrow morning at 8.30 again, is that right? Uh, yeah, 8.30 tomorrow morning, yeah. Let's just pay respect to the... Yeah, very good. Let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha.